Hey everybody, welcome back to the Iron Works Podcast. I'm Pastor Tyler. And I'm Zach. And we are so glad to have you all with us today, continuing our discussion of the Old and New Covenants. Uh, There's some difference of opinion on that that we've addressed. We are dispensationalists, but I would imagine most of what we're going to discuss today would be accessible for all believers. We hope that it is. Uh, It's been a while, a couple weeks since we released the last one, and in the meantime, we've had some pretty amazing things that happened uh, as a church. We had our Ironworks Conference. This is the Ironworks Podcast. We just had the Ironworks Conference, which I wanted to let you all know is available on the website. It's available on YouTube if you want to go check that out. Uh, Zach, what did we talk about this time? It was a pretty cool topic. Yeah, we had our very second annual (laughs) uh, Ironworks Conference, our first one we did on uh, prophecy, and we decided we'd keep the very simple and non-controversial topics going. So this time we called it the Afterglow Conference and we talked about the Holy Spirit. Um, but yeah, it was, the man, it supernatural was, aspects of the Christian life. It was so good, you guys. I would really encourage you guys to check out. I've been going back through some of the uh, sessions that I missed because I was helping out doing different things. Um, was really, really encouraged. I thought that it all went really well. We're bl- I just, and we've talked about this before, but we're just blessed as a fellowship to be able to do things like that. And I would, I would like to encourage you guys, if you're serving with a, with a small church and you think of these things as like, oh, that we're, we, we'll be able to do that when we're bigger. You guys should try stuff like this when you're small. Number one, it's, it's, you can do it. It's surprising what you can pull off when everybody pitches in and helps out. Number two, it is so fun. Yes, it is. Just to like, just to have us, we were talking about this with actually one of the newer couples at our church here. They were saying how blessed they were just to get to hang out with believers talking about Jesus for like a day and a half. And like, we don't have anything else to do. This is what we're going to do. We had so much fun. Um, I think it was really encouraging for everybody. Got to talk about miracles and healing and angels and demons and uh, although Thomas didn't quite dive into that like I was hoping he would, <laughs> I wanted him to like get in there, man, get your hands dirty with it. But he did a great, great job, yeah. Pastor Thomas Powell from Virginia Beach. But uh, we talked about all those different things because they're all in there. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I points I made in our first session was, man, the Bible is full of supernatural stuff, and if you try to minimize that, you're you're going to limit your faith. Yeah. So you know, we had afterglows and we had. Um, so a great time of prayer every mm-hmm. night. And y'all, we saw a bunch of people get healed. Yep. This is starting to pop up around our church more often, isn't it? Is. it Zach? Just, it is. I was in Peru two weeks ago and the Lord healed 10 people while I was there. And then he's done it since I've been back. He's done it here at this conference. Man, when you just start seeking the Lord and expecting that he's going to move, he starts to move. I was literally, I was just about to say that. It's like, it, it, it's not, guys, this stuff is not weird, and it's not crazy, and it's not inaccessible. These are things that the Lord wants to do, and it's really just as simple as, what if we showed up and expected the Lord to do the things that he said he'd do in his word and asked? And it is it is so cool to see the Lord do those things, to see them happen decently and in order and all those all those things. But, man, it's it's cool to, to see the Lord do stuff. So yeah, we're, it, we're was a, a it was time. a great time. So yeah. I, I encourage you all to go check it out. It's all free. Uh, on the website mm-hmm. and also on uh, Calvary Chapel Trustville's YouTube channel. You can watch the videos. You can listen to the podcast. Uh, we had a Q&A session in there where we got into some good stuff. Uh, somebody asked about sleep paralysis demons, so that was <laughs> fun to talk about. Uh, it's, yep. You know, it's all in there. I mean, yeah. we shouldn't avoid topics like that. Uh-huh. You know, this isn't the subject of the podcast today, but we shouldn't avoid things that are in the Bible, and that includes things that make people uncomfortable. It doesn't make me uncomfortable. It just excites me. It's like, let's just talk about this all the time if I had my way. But anyway, go check that out, guys. It's for free. We hope that those will only continue to grow, and uh, we'll have another one coming up pretty soon here, at least next year, and uh, maybe we can do more of them, and we'll just have to see how it goes. Mm. But we are continuing with our series on the Old and New Covenants, and uh, you, you could call this a section on salvation history, progressive revelation, dispensationalism. Really, this is about the Old and New Covenant, and today we're focusing on the continuities and the discontinuities between the Old and New Testament. We know that some things are different from the Old to the New, some things are the same, and this is what we're going to dive into today. We looked at salvation history, we looked at uh, the gospel, and now we're going to start looking at the practical side of things. This is where we're going to talk about Why don't Christians worship on Saturday typically? Why don't we have to keep the food laws? There are good answers to that, but I mean, I think, Zach, if there are a short list of internet Christian issues 
that get confused, <laughs> this is certainly on the short list. Would oh, you yeah. agree? Oh, yeah. If I had a dollar for every time we've we've discussed these with people or even I've kind of asked these questions through and said, now, hang on a second. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd have more dollars. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, this, this stuff gets talked about all the time. And I would say this area, this is why we, we picked this to do a season on is I think this area of theology is one of them that where there are more misconceptions and mistakes made than a lot of other areas I can think of. Once you, we talked about it. Once you make a mistake here and you misunderstand what the Lord is doing, it, it can have some big changes down the line. And this is what, this is kind of down the line that we've been talking about. This is where some of these issues start to pop up in your theology. When you make mistakes about what the Lord's doing for, you know, like we said, back in Genesis, back in, you know, with Abraham, this is where that stuff starts to show up. Yeah. Because it's very easy to find somebody online to make you feel bad for eating pork, for example. <laughs> like those, well, yep. right here in the Bible, don't you believe the Bible? And doesn't it say that? And a lot of these things we've just kind of absorbed and we do because it's what our pastor does, what our church tradition does. But uh, it's very easy to be put in a place where you've got to answer tough questions that you don't have answers to. So we're trying to help provide them. Mm. And as we go through this, what we're going to do is we're going to, we already looked at the the where we've been. And the Bible is also pretty plain on where we land, like right. what, on what we are still to do and what we are not to do. What we're going to try to do is bridge that gap. You can bridge it theologically. And I hope that this will give you uh, some rest as in your faith as a Christian and also uh, ward off some trouble from some people that would want to, as Paul say, spy out your liberty and bring you into bondage. Mm-hmm. So let's review just a little bit, Zach. We, we talked about the Mosaic Covenant which was a subsidiary of the Abrahamic promise that was given in Genesis chapter 12. Right. And that's an important thing to remember without getting into it again. As Paul makes the case in Galatians especially that the Abrahamic promise supersedes the Mosaic covenant and that that was always a, a kind of the nest within what God was doing through Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And we looked at the various purposes for which God gave the law last time. Why do we have a law of Moses in the first place? Uh, The first one we said was to create Israel as a nation, that God was creating a country to be ruled according to these laws. And and Zach, without diving into uh, certainly a whole other whole other swamp that we might not get (laughs) out of that, that context for the, the Old Testament law is so important that this was God's law for this nation. And when people want to come along and, and start applying these laws as standard for everybody, the context absolutely matters, does it not? Very, very important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, why, why is that? Why do we need to know that? Well, because, and we'll talk about, you know, we're talking kind of about how, what the issues that are caused when you pull things out of any time in, in the Bible, if you pull something out of context, you're about to make an issue, right? So the, the, the thing that starts to come up is people, like you said, will grab something that was in, in a whole piece that God was giving to his people and saying, I want you to act this way. I want you to have your laws be this way. And they will grab out a snippet that sounds like something they're familiar with. And they'll say, see, this is why we're not, you know, this is why this should be the punishment for adultery. Always. And, and now, which is death to be clear. Right. And, and that's, and, 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 you know, we need to be careful here because we're not saying that Christians, and we'll get into this. We're not saying that Christians just get to wad up the whole mosaic law and throw it over their shoulders and say, none of that matters to me. That's not what we're saying at all. But what we are saying is that you're also not allowed to snip a piece out of it and then try and paste it into, you know, you're, you living in the United States of America in 2023 and saying, see, this is what the legal code should be for us. That that context is really, really important. And we'll talk about what, what the changes and what use we are still supposed to make of the law too. Cause you know, Jesus made it clear. We're not allowed to just ball this up and throw it away. Right. Uh, this is what's called theonomy. Uh, it's a kind of theology mm. that it's God's law. They, they say that the law is to be applied for every nation, not just for Israel. Um, that's there are there are, could be an argument made for pieces of that, but I'll just say, and I hope you'll see today that that is not how God intended the law of Israel to be used mm. as a template to be lifted and placed somewhere else. Because nobody ever wants to argue that we've got to wear tassels on our robes; they, they just <laughs> want to take pieces of it and use <laughs> right. it, uh, exactly. which is what a, one of Paul's complaints that all these people that used to take the law they don't know anything about it, don't know what they're talking about, and they want to try to act like rabbis. But that was the first thing: is to establish Israel as a nation, mm-hmm. uh, to give them righteous laws. This is the piece that where we can concede a little bit to that: that God was in fact revealing righteousness. Now, there's right. no 
mandate for the average nation, shall we say, that you have to give adultery the death penalty. However, it does communicate that as far as God is concerned, adultery is a capital crime. Mm. That reveals what is righteous about God. And it would be very difficult to say that a nation was not being righteous if they had such a law. Does that make sense to you guys? That God was revealing his righteousness through the laws. He wouldn't have commanded something if there was not a righteousness behind it. Because righteousness, as we know, Zach, existed before the law did. That's another important <laughs> thing is that we, 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 we've talked about this already, so we'll just restate real quick. The law didn't make adultery wrong. Right. That's so, so important. Right. So therefore, we can't just say, see, we've got to apply God's law over here to our country because that's what makes adultery wrong. No, no, no. Without the legal structure of the Mosaic law, adultery is, God still punishes adultery. He says it's wrong. It's a sin. It's a, it's a stain. I, 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 you know, I'm going to judge for it. Same thing with murder. God was punishing murder in, you know, the first couple chapters yes, of Genesis exactly. without the Mosaic law. So we, we don't need to worry about, well, if we don't apply the law, how will we, you know, what, what then will happen? Well, God's character is still, God's is still very clear what he thinks. The, the, that's why the context is so important. This was God saying for my people, and again, this is where it becomes very important who God's people are. We, we, as dispensational people, believe that God hasn't gotten rid of his people Israel. A lot of times when you start getting into things like theonomy or trying to apply God's law everywhere like that, you basically have, you're, you're including in that the assumption that all of God's people, the believers, are exactly now God's chosen people. Right. And, and that's, you, you, you've you mixed the two up and that starts to cause problems. Yeah, which is why Paul warned us against that in mm -hmm. Romans chapter 11. He actually warned us against arrogance, but... Yeah, that, this is how you answer that question, by the way, that, well, we're not under the Old Testament law. So Leviticus 18, when it says that homosexuality was an abomination, that's not always wrong. Well, it, it's a very basic thing to say that God commanded it against it because it was wrong. Like That was true, right. and that's why God commanded right. it. And that is repeated many other places in the scripture. Mm -hmm. you, you're never going to arrive at that conclusion if you don't have an ax to grind. But uh, also, the third reason to establish a system of worship to give them the ceremonies, to give them the rituals and the sacrificial system. Uh, this is this is important not to separate this out because we tend to talk about the ceremonial, the civil, and the moral law. That is not a biblical distinction. It was all of a piece. And that if you were to say, well, you have to keep the law against adultery, but uh, not the one about sacrifices in the temple, you'd get stoned for that. Because it was all one law, that God was doing that, uh, as we're going to see in a minute, to prepare for the sacrifice of Jesus. And also, fourth of all, to codify the blessings and curses of their relationship to God. This is another bit of what I mean. You can't pick and choose which parts you like of the law. Because, <laughs> yes. you know, so many people, for example, I just taught on Deuteronomy 28. They want to preach on the first 14 verses of that chapter. You're God's people, so all these blessings belong to you. Number one, they forget the place where he says, if you will keep my laws and commandments. Correct. And the second thing they will skip is the remainder of that chapter, which is like three times as long with all the curses that were leveled against God's people. Also that. So, you know, and people will do all, all kinds of theology dodges to get out of that. But really what, what we need to learn as we're going to see today is that the Old Testament law is, in a very broad sense, not applicable to the Christian, except in a, in a general sense. But don't worry, I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Because this was the fifth purpose and really the ultimate and primary purpose of the law of Moses, which was to prepare Israel for their Messiah, who was going to bring mm. consummation to their covenant, who was going to actually fulfill everything that God had been saying from the beginning. Zach, what, what's your favorite way or ways that the Old Testament law prefigured Christ in such an obvious way that it's like impossible to miss it? Um, one of the big ones that has, it, it's, well, you said an obvious way or impossible to miss it, but well, the, it doesn't have to be just the sacrificial system to me. I think I, all, most people look at that and they say, oh yeah, that it's, it's showing us that we're preparing for a time when we won't need those sacrifices anymore. And that's made very clear when you go read Hebrews, right? Okay. But when we have, by going through slowly the, the, the Pentateuch and the law, like we've been doing in church verse by verse, you see so much of that. Like it's everywhere and the deeper you go into the sacrificial system the more you start seeing hey like that's like what jesus did over here and all the it's it's not just in the broad things like yes there's a sacrifice but it has to be done every time it's in the symbolism it's in like how they constructed the tabernacle and like everything and to me that's that's one of the easiest ones to pick out is like god was trying to show them almost like 
by the way they acted it out every single day. This is what I'm going to do. I'm not doing it yet, but I'm going to do this. And now yep. you have to do this, but later I'm going to actually fulfill this. And it was sin is going to require a blood sacrifice, right? And and it's going it, to because this is an imperfect blood sacrifice. You have to do it over and over, and you know to the point of where it was almost like God was building up in this, this feeling of expectation of like when are we going to be done with this? Yeah, which is exactly well, what he was 51 doing. Psalm yeah. fifty-one is my favorite example of this, where David says, "For you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it." The sacrifices of God are a contrite and broken mm-hmm. heart. That there, the Old Testament. We're going to hit this more later too. That uh, grace is not a new thing in the New right, Testament. Right, right. That was always the way to to be saved, to be forgiven. And there, there are no differences of how you get saved. And uh, I, of course, we could lay out all the different prophecies of of what Jesus did. You know, you look at the Passover lamb, right? That the lamb of God who was slain and blood covers the door so that death would pass you by. Mm-hmm. And the death, the blood is actually, you know, in the shape of a cross, which is, that's just bonus, right? you know, <laughs> but that's when John the Baptist saw Jesus and called him the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that his blood was spilled to be placed over our lives so that death will pass us by mm-hmm. like that. That's exactly what we've been waiting for, looking for. And we talked about that some last time, that this is what the goal of the law always was, that it revealed God's righteousness, right? That this is how God is, and this is what he expects of people. And if you read the law, man, it is harsh stuff. It is harsh stuff. That if you if you do this, you're going to be taken out into the street, and you're going to be stoned. Like, my goodness gracious. Or sometimes he'll say, there is no sacrifice for this sin. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, that's... That's really hard. And this is why people that get obsessed with the law of Moses, especially who are Christians, become, become harsh harsh people yep. because they don't have time. They don't have room for grace. And you you can be strong on God's commandments, but if you have the grace of Jesus Christ, you, you can balance it with love just as God himself is. But it also is to demonstrate man's unrighteousness. Mm-hmm. And this is where people that are obsessed with the law often miss it is because they think that I am good enough to keep this law, yes. but the rest of you peasants <laughs> can't, which is exactly what the Pharisees were. Yep. I, it's amazing that we still get the same kinds of people doing the same kinds of things. Yep. That we need to be harsher and stronger in this, but you know, I'm good. I'm doing just fine. It's it's a very, that's why arrogant people, I think, Zach, I, I don't know if this produces arrogant people or if it attracts arrogant people. Yeah, chicken uh, and egg. Maybe <laughs> Yeah, maybe a bit of both, yeah. right? But what it was supposed to show us is that you're hopeless, man. You have no yes. chance. Your righteousness, to quote Isaiah, is as filthy right. rags. There's nothing splendid or redeeming that you can give to God. God, I, I like to say, you're not a diamond in the rough. You're just rough. Right. And God can take that and make something wonderful out of it. And the Lord loves you and, and created you to uh, be for his glory, right? But you have nothing that you can contribute to that until your soul has been regenerated. And even then, you're doing it by the grace of Jesus Christ. Well, we talked about David, right? David is a perfect example, I think, of of how, because God says, David is a man after my own heart. And we look at David and we're like, well, how does that work? David is yeah, a, Are you sure? Yeah, David's a, you know, he he's so violent that at a time when God was just fine with using violent people to do things, God said, you are slightly too violent, <laughs> right? He was, he was so, he was a, I mean, I think it's pretty clear in scripture that David had a, a problem with women. He was a, oh, had really? a, a sexual that, issues. Yeah. He, in there. Yeah. He, um, you know, he was, he, he did all kinds of crazy things. Right. And yet God looks at him and says, that's my guy. That's the one I like. Yeah. Right. And, and so That'd we. That would be a great Bible well, study to do, man, is what did God like about David well, so much? Yeah. All this bad stuff. And I think one of the things clearly is God said, look, that's, this is the heart that I am trying to produce through the law. I, I want to produce a person who sees my law, sit, you know, has wrote the longest chapter in the Bible about how beautiful my law is, and then sits there and says, but I can't keep it. That's such a great way to phrase that, Zach, that this is the kind of heart that God wanted the law to produce. It was David, who is a vile sinner, and yet, man, he, he knew that he needed God. His, his only righteousness was in Christ, or, well, the anticipation of Christ. He had given up, right, and he had given up his own attempts and had just said, look, like, I, I, can't, I can't bring a sacrifice for the stuff I did. There's nowhere in, the, in your law that lets me off the hook. I'm just relying on your grace. Like God, and God says, that, that guy, yeah. pay attention to that guy, right? <laughs> Do it like David. Right. And, and That's so, why Jesus was called the son of David, exactly. right? That he's like, this is exactly what I want. Psalm 49, verse 7, which is actually of the sons of Korah. It's not of David. Um, but again, talk about grace, man, and redemption. 
I mean, if you know who Korah was. But Psalm mm-hmm. 49 verse 7 says, Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. Verse 8, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice, verse 9, that he should live on forever and never see the pit. And that's the other principle the law was trying to teach us. You cannot ransom somebody else's life. Why? Because you got your own problems. And it tells us that <laughs> right. God would accept a sacrifice, but over and over again, the Old Testament, Samuel and Isaiah and David, right? That, come on, guys, bulls and goats are not going to, that's not really what I'm after. Right. That God, they, we needed something greater than that. And also to hold the nation together until that day. All of this was to bring us to what Christ did at the cross. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 says, So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. The law, Paul said, and he's writing Galatians to a group of people, uh, mostly Gentiles, that were getting seduced by people that were saying, you've got to keep the law too. Mm -hmm. And Paul has nothing but harsh words for them. He said, the law, what was the purpose of the law? It was our guardian, our tutor, our schoolmaster to teach us to anticipate salvation by faith in Christ. So this is why, to go on a little rabbit trail here, It's not good for Christians to have a fascination with Judaism as it stands today, the the traditional rabbinical interpretations of the Old Testament law, and then try to apply those to the the scripture because Paul and the other apostles and Jesus himself made it abundantly clear that the Jews missed the greatest and, in fact, you might say the only purpose of the law, which was to anticipate Jesus Christ. Yeah, to, I mean... No, we shouldn't always use Lord of the Rings to do theology, but sometimes, um, you know, the, literally the Jews are supposed to be God. God's got his chosen people and they are sitting on the throne of David as stewards. The, it's, you know, Gondor's throne is empty <laughs> and yes. God is like, sit here for a minute and I'm I'm coming back to put my king there. But you you take care of this and here's my rules. Here's and they wouldn't leave. The, the, yeah. the, that was what the Pharisees were is they're they're sitting there right like the guy who's I'm the steward but I'm not letting go of any of the power I, I won't I don't want the king to come back because he doesn't yeah. look like what I want and I'm I'm in charge right and they have not left their Messiah's throne that's literally what's happening and so I think it is a big mistake for us to look at that and say well what are they doing over there that's interesting when the reality is these are the these are the people this is the same spiritual lineage that Jesus came to make like war against yeah Jesus it, came to the, say you these are the people that Jesus kicked out of the temple these are the and again I'm not saying like the Jews Come on, guys. I'm not saying the Jews like as a race. I'm we saying we don't need to give disclaimers here. No, I mean, the, the Bible is pretty Phariseism. clear. We all know what yeah. you're saying. Right. Like, yeah. Is, that, is, this is exactly yeah. what the Bible says. Right. That wrath has come upon them. Yeah. And that they are remaining under wrath until there's redemption coming for them. But, you know, I think this is kind of fading now. At least um, it, it was kind of in the academic world when I was in seminary. It trickled down to the average common man. And I think it's kind of on its way out. But there was a recent obsession with the intertestamental literature. Which you know the Maccabees, the Apocrypha, yes. you know, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. not not all the Deuterocanon, but some of the other ones too. And people were saying, well, if we want to understand the New Testament, we've got to understand what happened in the intertestamental period. Now that has limited value because, all right, in order to understand what a Pharisee is, you kind of got to know that stuff. Sure. And in order to, well, I should say you don't have to because the New Testament gives you enough to go off of, <laughs> right. right? But it's not a lot of the questions and the the quotations that are given. It's like, oh wow, that actually was kind of in the air at the time, but. Jesus' ministry so much was telling them that all your traditions that you've come up with in the last 400 years are wrong. Yeah, yeah. And I don't understand guys that want to go back and say, this is how we have to reinterpret the New Testament. When the Lord Jesus himself came out saying, you guys have completely missed the point. And the point is me. Yes. You know, I I saw, I have not watched the whole show. I probably should, but I watched a clip of uh, The Chosen the other day where they were eating the eating the grains in the, mm-hmm. in the field. And of course they get all banana shape about it. And you're teaching them to harvest on the Sabbath. And Jesus kind of tries to tell them Sabbath was made for man, right? You know, not man for the Sabbath. And they keep pushing him. This is scripture. It's not just a movie, but then this, the way he delivered the line, he's like something greater than the Sabbath is here for the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. 
that's something we got to, you know, I, Zach, are you like me? And I know y'all were way off on a, on a rabbit trail here. This might even be like a Buffalo trail. I don't know, but, <laughs> uh, I can tend to be rather intellectual about the way I approach scripture sometimes uh-huh, yes. in that I, 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 sometimes I want to avoid resorting to the argument, well, Jesus is God. He can do whatever he wants. But there are cases in the Bible where that's exactly what Jesus said is I'm God. I'm the son of God and I can do whatever I want. Yeah. And that, that's really the fundamental tenet of Christian theology, isn't it? That well, God is God and you're not. And I think it's it's why we have to be careful when we're doing theology that we're doing it the right way because it's, it'd be very easy for us to kind of parse everything out and, well, here's my, you know, my nice 17-page diagram that shows how the how salvation— I love diagrams. I do too. It shows how, you know, salvation history goes. But the but like you said, it if it doesn't boil down to what Jesus said, which is, yeah, I fulfilled all that, guys. You know, if or if somehow it ends up contradicting what Jesus said, then we've got a problem, right? And and yes, yes I agree that Jesus, when when these questions came up, Jesus was very. We've talked about this on other issues, even today. We were we were laughing about how Jesus didn't do a whole like, I'm gonna pay, I'm gonna play along with your weird questions game. Jesus would just point to himself yeah. and say, No, the answer is you know C. Like me is the answer, especially in the Gospel of John. Yeah, and and I think especially in issues of the law, Jesus didn't always give you this logically logically happy little res- resolution. He just said, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about me. Right. I'm and, the son of man. To, to bounce off of that, part of what makes Jesus's uh, ar- arguments, teachings about the law sound so al- almost like non sequiturs sometimes. It's like, that, what, this isn't really where the, the <laughs> literature of the day is. It's because they had gotten it so wrong. Yes. So let, let's dive into this. Matthew chapter 5. We're actually going to try to give you one of those diagrams here that <laughs> Zach is talking about. Because <laughs> uh, I think the Bible gives us that. Yes. You know, uh, he'll tell you. I've got a whiteboard in my office, and very often he comes in and he finds like... We have stuff you know, on the whiteboard now. I'm yeah, looking up he, at it. Yeah. He'll, you know, the trying to catch a murderer <laughs> thing, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I love doing this, but... You know, Matthew 5, 17 through 18, I think one of the most mis- up, misinterpreted verses of Jesus is when he said, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, and the word yoda is the smallest letter of the Greek alphabet, not a dot, which is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Point is, all the smallest little piece of the law will not go away. Now, some people want to plant their flag on that, and aha, there you see, we must keep the law even to yeah. this day. Man, many people, yes. actually, that, that's where the flag gets planted when you're arguing right. that is, hey, see, Jesus said, Jesus said it does, you know, and, and they use Jesus' words to fight Jesus' words. See, Jesus, Jesus here said that the law doesn't pass away, so it doesn't matter anything that Jesus says later on. This thing, right, it's, again, taking something out of context. Yes. Go on. And they miss what he says, to fulfill them. Right. Not it will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. He's saying everything that the law promised is going to be fulfilled and completed. And you look at what Jesus did. Jesus' life was a fulfillment of the law. Yes. Hebrews is the is the whole is a whole big long book in the New Testament Correct. about this. And anybody I would I would encourage you who is if enamored and infatuated with the idea of the Old Testament law, I found a lot of times these are people who really have no connection to their own culture and their own heritage, and they admire the the Jewish tradition and, mm-hmm. and legacy, which there's something admirably said for that. But, you know, what does the Bible say? Right. And uh, there's a couple things. He provided the perfect sacrifice. Jesus was, as we said, the Lamb of God. And there are several verses in the Bible that straight up tell us that certain yes. things are no longer for the church anymore. Correct. And I'm going to read some of these verses to you, and uh, then we're going to kind of explain how how Jesus got there. In verse uh, chapter 9, verse 12 of Hebrews, it says, Jesus entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Once for all, an eternal redemption. This abrogated the need for sacrifice. So because of what Jesus has done, there is no need for sacrifice any longer. Now, I do not know that I've met a Hebrew roots guy or one of those people that believe we ought to get back to animal sacrifice. But Zach, have you you ever encountered somebody that thinks we ought to be sacrificing animals still? No, but I think this is one of the, this is a very important point that this is uh, who over and over and over, Paul says, you cannot cherry pick. 
Mm-hmm. He says that this is the this is God's whole law. We have got this weird habit where we we oh that's the Ten Commandments. There is no Ten Commandments. There are six hundred and is it six hundred thirteen or six hundred thirty? You would know. Yeah, I, I wouldn't though. Unfortunately, yeah, James um, two ten. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. So it's the whole thing. Now what people will do is they'll say, well, see, Jesus still wants us to keep the feasts, but the sacrifices are set aside. Which that first of all, that's not true. Second of all, you what, can't what's do the point that. Of this, of the feast without a sacrifice. Yeah, exactly, and you can't do that with that with the law. Paul says, no, you don't get to grab a piece of it that you like and say, you know. And that's the problem. Of course, no one says in this day and age, no one's going to say, well, you you have to kill a lamb. Number one, if you know anything about salvation history and you're claiming to be a Christian, you're not going to do that. So they they set that aside. But if you're going, if that has been set aside, Jesus is saying, if you set aside any of it, the whole thing is fulfilled. You can't you can't get rid of a part. Yeah. and keep the rest of it. Yeah, so that's a very obvious, blatant one, that there are right. no more sacrifices. And I think most people agree with that. Yes. Um, the Jews don't even do sacrifices today. However, let me put out a little warning, a preemptive warning. Were the temple to be rebuilt, and it used, and were it to be open for Gentiles to come and worship again? Guys, our sacrifice has already been made. Yeah. We have a once-for-all sacrifice in Christ Jesus. You do not need to be going in and making sacrifices for your sins. Of course, we won't be there when that happens, but that's another discussion. <laughs> yeah, unless you believe the temple is going to be built first, and then the rapture will happen. Yeah, that's a good point. I do not, because, uh, anyway. A little eschatology movie, movie. <laughs> detour right there. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we know we don't have to keep sacrifices. Most people are with me on that one, right, okay? Right, Well, there's another one, though. Mark seven nineteen. Jesus is talking about food, mm. and he said, Food enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. And Mark gives a little commentary. Thus, Jesus declared all foods clean. Y'all, I do not know how you wriggle out from underneath that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus declared all foods clean. Now, there's also in Acts, the book of Acts, I believe it's chapter 10, where Peter had a vision of the sheep being lowered and he said, kill and eat all the different unclean foods. And Mm -hmm. he said, what God has called uh, clean, you must not call unclean. And that seems to me pretty clear that you can eat whatever food you like. However, (laughs) However, these people will say, well, okay, well, that's just talking about the Gentiles. All right, fair enough. But I think it's more inclusive than that. But Mark seven nineteen, Jesus declared all foods clean. Mm-hmm. Foods. What, what do you, I mean, but people do this, don't they, Zach? We yes, still come do. across these people. Well, and also what I find is, and this is, we're, we're kind of opening this box, so let's just jump right in. One of the things with legalism that you will find is that it will often come to you in very acceptable forms. And then once it gets its hooks into you, it's hard to let go. And it does really spiritual damage to people. And that's one of the reasons why I think we need it to... It preys on people's guilt because that's what yes, the law does. that's correct. it awakens guilt in you. So what happens is, for example, people... what I Because you're asking this question. I can answer this question for you, because having dealt with Judaizers in... Let's go. Here in the United States, here over in Israel. What, what happens is people will say, well, yes, yes, yes. And th- these are, remember... Well-meaning people who understand, G- they, they, they're not Jew, you know, just cultural Jews. These are believers in Jesus who will say, well, yes, that's true. We, we don't have to do this. But if you yeah. really, if you really You're want more spiritual to, if you do. Yes. If you really want to please God, if you really, if you want to be blessed, right? You want to enjoy all these things that God gave you. So here, let me take this backpack of sin and guilt and shame that, that's filled with the law and put it back on your back again. And then you can enjoy all the things God wants you to enjoy. That's that's literally the argument is, well, but God gave God gave us these. And he said that these are forever, that they're never going to pass away. So Until yes. Until all has been fulfilled. Right. So, so they'll, they'll say, well, you don't have to, but we're definitely going to look at you weird if you, if you don't. Now, now yeah. that's what legalism does, right? It says, look, I'm not, I know that the Bible doesn't say this is a sin, but I'm just saying, let's be safe and do it anyway. Yeah, but I will say that you're right. You're totally right. That's where, it, well, I just think it'd be better. And listen, guys, if you want to abstain from pork, knock yourself out. Right. But don't think you're gaining anything with God on no, that. not at all. Because you're totally not. Not at all. And th- this is where Paul would say to the Galatians, are you so foolish? Mm. Which is, what are you, stupid? <laughs> I mean, really, that's how <laughs> yep. intense it is. Are, having begun by the Spirit, are you now going to be perfected by the flesh? Hmm. I was baptized with the Holy Spirit and, and encountered God. And my soul has been saved. But if I really want to get there, I got to stop eating pork. Yeah. What? Romans fourteen seventeen says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, hmm. but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's not about eating. It, it's, it's not a thing. Right. That's what the, the lesson is, that foods don't matter. Jesus, in that rather graphic verse I just read in, uh-huh. in Mark, he said, you eat food, it goes in your stomach and it comes out the other end. 
It didn't do anything to your soul. Right. Well, then why did God give them the food laws to be kept? Because all the reasons I just stated before, mm-hmm. that he was trying to separate them. He was trying to establish them as different from the rest of the world. But in G- Jesus in Mark seven nineteen declared all foods clean. And you know what I want to say about that too is there's a reason, I believe there's a reason why very often people cling on to these smaller, almost, I don't want to say silly because God's law isn't silly, but they cling on to the the most insignificant parts of the law, the hardest, because those are the easiest for them to keep. Yeah. And what I mean by that is when you're a legalist, you're struggling really against your heart, knowing that you don't have the Holy Spirit in the way that you need to have it. So because have him, have him, sorry, excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. This is, that is the one time where we will allow pronoun correction on this podcast. It is very, very Ooh, important. That'll preach. Yeah. 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 That's, um, a, that's a great preach. Th- there you go. Right there. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You, you're you not communing with God in the way you know you must. And so there, but what I can do is I can make sure I don't eat bacon. That's easy. So then I, now good. No bacon eating has been, ha- has happened. Therefore I'm good. Right? So you, of course you major on the minors because the minors are something you can accomplish in the flesh. And then you can feel like you're righteous and then you can look down your nose at other people and you can yep. stand on your high horse. So I think almost it, that's that's why people cling on to these is they feel if I let go of these, how will I know that I'm OK with God? That's the that's the secret ah, that's in their heart you'll is need faith. Uh, yeah, well, you? you'll need faith. And also you 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 might know in the back of your mind as a legalist, I have some experience here. You might know that really you you're not all that sure where you're standing with the Holy Spirit. You and him yeah. haven't talked that much. <laughs> so you so you really don't have a lot to recommend you, you think, before God without these things that you're bringing, your, your little carton of filthy rags that you're trying to hold yeah. up. Paul know. said in Colossians, he said that such rules like that have an appearance of wisdom. Yes. But they have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. How much value? No. None value. Value. Zero percent value. Yeah. That oh well I can I can control this yep and that that means I'm probably okay in my soul but no it, it doesn't affect your soul mm. and and you gotta you you've gotta let go like you've gotta salvation is letting go of anything you can do to save yourself mm-hmm. and it's relying upon Jesus Christ and Him alone that's what it meant by Jesus fulfilled the law He provided the ultimate and final sacrifice the ultimate and final righteousness. And we're, we're working through some of the specifics here, but you can never forget that the Passover lamb, has already, his blood has already been shed for you. Yes. What are you going to add to that? Right. You know, this means that we don't sin, but you, you, these things are not sins that we're talking about. Right. We're talking about things that are irrelevant. So that that's... That's the Bible says very plainly. We don't need sacrifices anymore because of Jesus. Right. We don't need the food laws anymore because, because of, of Jesus. Jesus. Now, Colossians two 17. I'll read 16 and 17. Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. There it is again. Or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Mm. These things are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one judge you because of the holy days. This is the other thing. We do not have to keep holy days anymore as Christians. And I love that it says, let no one judge you. It doesn't just say, do what you'd like to do. Don't let anybody put a trip on you. Yeah, don't let anybody put a trip on you. If somebody comes and looks down their nose, tell them, I am holding on to the substance, which is Christ. What are you holding on to? That's what you're allowed. You are allowed to do that, right? Yeah. To, to say that. And and I, that's important. Why? Because you, it's so easy to get distracted by the shadow. It's so easy to be paying attention to, well, over here, they worship on Saturday. And they told me that if, if I do it on Sunday, it's actually not Jesus day. And so I, you, it, people get caught up in these trips and they feel guilty. And then they come to you and they're really concerned because they want to please God. They love Jesus. They want to please him. But they've been they've been so caught up in these things that they're being distracted from Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Th- these things act as a distraction from Jesus. And that's that's not good. And it's okay to point at someone that's telling you that and say, hey, w- the point is Jesus, right? We're doing this because of Jesus, right? So if, if I'm worshiping Jesus on Sunday and you're worshiping Jesus on Saturday, the, the, the really important thing is, are we worshiping Jesus? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and you know, you need to really stand on those things. Remember, guys? Especially, it can be hard to let go of some of these things because it can feel like you're sinning. Yeah, but you, your, your conscience is off. Yes, and so go back to Scripture and check Scripture. Check what we're saying by Scripture. See in Scripture if we're telling you to go against something where God says, do not do this, I'm commanding you it's a sin, or we're telling you to let go of something that God is commanding us to let go of. Yeah. There is a difference. Romans 14, 5, another verse. This actually might have been a better verse to read than the one I did, but... Paul said, one person esteems one day as better than another, Mm -hmm. while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. 
What's Paul saying? Doesn't matter, guys. Right. Worship on whatever day you like. Worship on every day, shouldn't you? So, of course. Uh, we're, we're getting these specifics again that mm-hmm. no need for sacrifice or food laws or holy days because of Christ. Why? Because Christ fulfilled all the, the festivals and the feasts. He fulfilled the new moon. He fulfilled the Sabbath. It all finds its rest in Christ. Yep. And the Bible even tells us in certain places that if you're trying to observe the Sabbath, you're trying to find rest in something that is not Jesus. You might say that sounds harsh. Huh. Well, that's what the Bible says. Yeah. You're trying to find rest and salvation and absolution and and assuaging your guilt in something other than faith in Jesus Christ. And we're saved by faith alone, friends. Yeah. You know, let, let's dive into this little thing here. When we talk about people that say, the most common one here is people say you got to worship on Saturday, not Sunday. I would say that these things have been in ascending order. Not very many people say you got to do sacrifices. There are more people that say you got to keep the food laws. There are a lot of people who say that you need to worship on Saturday in order to be saved. And here's a a strange historical thing they try to pull out. They try to say that the church started worshiping on Sunday at the Council of Nicaea in around 325 uh, AD, I believe it was. And they said that Emperor Constantine mandated that the church start worshiping on Sunday because he worshiped the sun god, and that was the day that he preferred to worship. That is absolutely ahistorical and is not what was discussed at the Council of Nicaea. I cannot believe that this myth continues to be perpetuated. It's it's ridiculous. There's a lot of weird myths about the Council of Nicaea. Yes, everybody <laughs> believes. And, and it, it's like... Every uh, weird thing that? goes back to... It, what's the, the book? The Da Vinci uh, Code. Yes, yes. People get it from that. Like that, yeah. oh, this is where it, what it was. The Council of Nicaea was to resolve the Arian controversy, mm-hmm. which was, is Jesus God very God or is he not? That's what they were there to discuss. And they resolved some other minor matters too. But this the idea that this was Constantine coming in and bullying the church, that is simply not what happened on that day. You can think whatever you want about Constantine, but what then this, here, here's, so here's the first thing. That's not what happened. Right. The church had been worshiping on Sunday. Uh, even we have early Roman records of them reporting that the ch- Christians gathered early in the morning on the first day of the week. It was to commemorate the resurrection. Correct. Because the Feast of First Fruits had been fulfilled when Jesus was the first fruits from the dead on a Sunday. Also, probably because some of these Gentiles were not permitted into the synagogues, which worshiped on Saturday, and most of the Jews continued to attend the synagogue early on. So there was a distinction and a disparity between them there. This was already being done. But Zach, even if that was the case, does it really matter what day we're worshiping on? I kind of classify that in the same as the people who want to, you know, brandish their sheaf of file. And I'm not trying to be harsh or mean to anybody. I'm sorry. If, I'll if be you, mean. Okay. You you bring me your, your whole, you know, collection of internet memes about how, you know, Christmas is bad because the, the pagans used to work. You know, guys, I don't, it's okay. I don't care. You know why? Because Jesus is resurrected from the dead. And Christmas, when I celebrate Christmas, I'm commemorating Jesus. I'm not going to accidentally worship a demon. That, yeah, can I jump you know, on? I'm going to pounce on that. So the, the, all, this whole idea of like accidental paganism. Correct. I, I right. do not understand this. Yep. The idea that you are secretly summoning demons into your house when you're worshiping Jesus. Yeah. When you're, you not know, how it works. Christmas, for example, you're singing, you know, oh, come all you faithful, joyful and triumphant. Let us come to Bethlehem and worship him or hark the herald angels sing, you know, right. hail the heaven born prince of peace, born to raise the sons of earth. It, and oh, but don't don't do it with a Christmas tree because then you're worshiping Satan. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Isn't this a mark of the victory of the cross? Oh, it's one hundred percent. Even if some of these traditions, which might be likely for all I know, because you you it just depends on which historian you ask for these things. Right. But you know, even if oh the fir tree that was a pagan symbol. Well, it's not anymore because right. you had to dig it up on the internet and find it, and you're still not even sure. Yeah. Now people see fir tree and they think, what? Christmas. What's Christmas for? Jesus born of a virgin. That is like the best, like you talk about cultural erasure. Yeah. Like the pagan gods are forgotten yeah. and all that remains is Jesus. Why don't we celebrate my, that? My favorite, my favorite on this, paganism. my favorite on this was Twitter was people who were like, you know, well, don't you understand that this used to be pagan? And we were like, yes, and we're coming for Toyotathon next. Like... <laughs> 
<laughs> you keep you keep arguing and we're going to take shark week right like of course these are ours now like our shark god week. has oh has gosh. conquered and now now all the days are his you know and yes. so of course oh, i'm I not love that all you know the days. of course i'm not scared you know well don't you know that tuesday used to be tuesday because it was yeah i know that was the quakers right that didn't want to use uh yeah. Mike still for all i know they didn't the want names, to use the names, right. names of the days i, of the I know week. those names used to be you know norse names i don't care i celebrate jesus those on all those dead. days now yeah jesus is alive right now exactly. listen there might be some who feel really convicted about that and just don't feel right about it sure and they are fully free to abstain from those things of and course the bible says you got to celebrate christmas no you're missing out, I think, yeah. but you don't have to. <laughs> right. And there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't worship on Saturday, but you cannot walk around acting like this is the way to do it and everybody else who's doing it is wrong. Correct. Certain Adventist uh, groups say that it's mm-hmm. the mark of the beast to worship on Sunday, which yeah. is Very preposterous sad. to me. Right. And, and and of course, nobody wants to talk about Wednesday night service. Is that okay? Can I worship on Wednesday? Splitting the difference. How about home fellowship on Tuesday and Thursday night? What if we have a prayer meeting on Sunday night? According to the Hebrew reckoning, that's technically Monday. So isn't that a lo- It's Yeah. This is plain in Scripture, guys, that the day doesn't matter. Mm. And if you say, I prefer to do Saturday, go for it, friend. I don't care. Lots I mean, of churches I know have Saturday services. We'll miss you on but, Sunday, though. Yeah, we'll miss you like. on Sunday. You're you're out of the line of the whole tradition of the church from the beginning. But guys, it's okay. Mm. If for some reason we had to start doing Tuesdays, that's the big day. All right, that's fine. Yeah, because every day is alike in Christ Jesus. And here's the last one, the last obvious one uh, that we've looked at. The plain verse in Scripture: We don't have to do sacrifices. Plain verse in Scripture, we don't have to keep the food laws. Plain, plain verse in Scripture, we don't have to keep holy days. And now Galatians five six. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. It doesn't even matter if you're circumcised, guys. Abraham was saved by faith before he was circumcised. So the idea that this is what you have to do, or any such ritual Correct. that you have to do to be saved, salvation is through Jesus and what he's done. So we've looked at all of these these very specific things Mm. where we have the Old Testament law that Jesus was coming to fulfill it. And then the New Testament gives us very plain statements about we don't have to do these things. So if anybody wants to come at you and say, how can you eat pork when the Bible says we shouldn't eat anything that you shouldn't eat pigs? You say, well, Mark 7, 19, it says that Jesus declared all foods clean. Boom. Mm -hmm. Why don't you keep the Sabbath? Because Jesus is my Sabbath day and one man esteems every day alike, but the Lord really doesn't care. This is... So good to know this, that yeah. the, the Bible just straight up tells us. We're going to get into the theology and the explanation of it now, but, I mean, Zach, does any any further encouragement on this that, like, the Bible just straight up tells you that you don't have to do these things? I think it's important the Bible tells us because this has been a this has been a controversy. Don't feel bad about, like, feeling bad about this or being confused. This has been difficult since the beginning. <laughs> Paul— If we're passionate, it's because I, I hate seeing people get bound up in this right. stuff. That's right. And, and Paul wrote whole letters— so churches that were all caught up and bound up and had people who were, you know, be, you know, put, trying to enslave them, Paul said, to the law. So it was very important to Paul. In fact, the times when he got most upset <laughs> were, were around these things, really. So no, guys, it's, it's, it is important. Jesus came to set you free from sin, from death, from the law, from all those things. And, and but if you're worried, if you're worried, here's my last instruction. If you look at this and say, but but if I do, if I set aside those things, what about the, what about moral things like homosexuality? What about murder? What about adultery? We're going to talk about those, but it's very important that we're making a distinction. We are not telling you just do whatever you, whatever you feel like in your heart about murder. We are telling you do whatever, com- you know, God commends you to do about things that are not sins. Yes. They were never, it would, they were only given as rules in the law. And now Jesus says he's fulfilled them. That's it. Don't feel like in, in saying okay to this, you're letting go and somehow liberalizing yourself. And now it's all up in the air. And if you, if you want to, you know, marry a man and you're a man, well, it's all new now because Jesus sets you free. That's not what yeah, we're saying. Paul There's was a difference. Of that. Paul was often yes, accused he was. of that. Yeah. And, and he says such people, they don't, they don't know anything. <laughs> what, what did Peter say? He, he said something really, uh, I got to pull this one up. He said something pretty uh, funny about the people that have opposed Paul. But uh, by the way, Peter also said in Acts 15 that, oh, the that law, they were untaught. He says, uh, <laughs> <I think. laughs> oh, here you go. The ignorant and unstable oh, there we go. twist what Paul says to their own destruction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so somebody that comes in and wants to twist Paul to be like, you can do whatever you want, man. Peter mm-hmm. says that you are ignorant and unstable. Yeah. Well, 
And he twisted, because you're twisting things to your own destruction. Yep. He also said in Acts 15 that the law was a burden that neither we nor the fathers of the Jews were able to bear. So why that. do we want to put it on anybody else? I love that verse. So yep. now, here's the thing. That's a lot of the discontinuity mm-hmm. between the Old and New Covenant. But here's what I want us to, to remember. The, the wrong thing to do is to portray the law itself as evil. That's right. That the law yes. was something wicked and, and an enemy. The law was only our enemy because of sin. Right. That the law was like a flashlight shining. Oh, yeah, you got roaches under here. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. But what we also want to see as we get into more of the continuity here, that this is always where the law was headed. It was always going this way. When Jesus came at the Sermon on the Mount, we already read it at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Uh, he said, don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. The reason Jesus said that is because all of the things he was about to say were going to sound to their ears like he was abolishing the law. Mm-hmm. So you're saying we don't have to keep the law anymore. But he says, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. So when the uh, here's what it is. The Jews so misunderstood the law. Yes. That Christ's corrections to their understanding of the law sounded like an abolition of the law. Mm-hmm. Hear that again. That when Jesus corrected the law, the Jews had so misunderstood it that they could not even fathom that this was still keeping the law. Could you say that that's true of legalists nowadays too? I think so. I think you could, right? That if you cannot separate certain rules and regulations from what you, what is true religion, mm-hmm. then you've got it wrong. If you say, well, if I don't worship on Sunday, I don't know how, how you can be a Christian. You're missing it, guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you, you've got to, the Jesus have, among other things, just stripped everything down to the bare bones. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's you and me guys. That's why we call it a religion, a relationship, not a religion. It is a religion. I don't want to get into that right now, but <laughs> I mean, it is obviously, but no, it's, I, it's you and Jesus. What, and, what but, you're saying is important though, because it, it, it's like, maybe this will help people to understand. You can almost imagine like, this isn't what happened, but you can almost imagine like an alternate history, an alternate timeline where the Jews took the law. And they did the things that God asked them to do and they got it right. And they were, they were serving God with the right heart and they were keeping the law and the prophets came and corrected them and they said, okay. And then they corrected and their experience with Jesus would have been totally different because Jesus would have come and said, Hey guys, I'm, I'm here to fulfill the law. And they would have said, that's great. We knew you were coming to fulfill the law. We saw that that was happening all along. And now we don't want this anymore because we have you. You're the Messiah. Yeah, that's, that's what it should have been. What should have happened. Simeon and Anna. It, it should out. have been all Simeons and Anna saying, that's exactly what I was hoping for. I was hoping I wouldn't die before you came to fulfill the law. But guys, that's not what happened, right? Nope. Why? Because of they sin. Because in their sinful hearts, they got more and more stubborn and they focused more and more on trying to do the impossible thing, which is conquer their own sinful hearts on their own with the law. They, they, were, they ended up deciding that the schoolmaster was what they were going to cling to rather than their own Messiah. So what, yes, Jesus came and had to confront them because they did it wrong. Nothing they were doing was in the heart of what he wanted them to do with the law. Yes. Yeah, I, that when Jesus comes in and says, "Guys, it's not enough just to not hate some, not to kill somebody. You got to not hate them." They go, "Wow, this is hard to yeah. get that." Or he's like, "Guys, really, does it really matter what foods you eat?" They were like, "Whoa, that's like I don't know if I can accept that." Even Jesus here, this is something else I want to say that is so important. Jesus's interpretation of the Old Testament law, which is the right one because he's the incarnate Word of God. All Seems right. important. <laughs> Here's something that you need to recognize. Jesus' interpretation of the Old Testament is fully consonant with the Old Testament. Jesus was not innovating with the things that he said. He is even uh-huh. harmonious with Moses. Now, he was doing a new thing, but it was a new thing that was already in line with what had been said. Jesus was teaching things that can be found and supported from the Old Testament. And it was not the Old Testament that was being corrected. It was the Jews understanding of the Old Testament that was being corrected. This is why, by the way, just to go back to that earlier point, this is why it's, and I I think, I agree that I think we're getting away from this, I hope, but this is why guys, look, I want to talk right to the guys that are like young teachers or pastors or whatever. You can't listen to these people who are saying, well, but you really don't understand the Old Testament until you hear the rabbinical interpretation. Oh, goodness That's gracious. That's wrong. <laughs> that's wrong. And it, why is it wrong? Why would I go to the theologians, the scholars, the millennia of, of interpreters who messed things up so bad that when Jesus came, their Messiah, they killed him? 
and I'm going to ask them what their interpretation of God's law is. Yeah, when, she, when I have Paul Jesus, says that their eyes are blinded. Yes, when I have Jesus' interpretation, which contradicted theirs. Yes. Completely. So guys, that's that's why I'm not being anti I'm not being anti historical or saying like go okay, go get a little bit of a flavor maybe if you want to, but understand that this is the flavor that Jesus came to resist. Yeah. And and Jesus was not in conflict with Moses or David. Of course not. Or Isaiah or Amos or Malachi or any of those guys. They were all pointing to him. Old Testament teaching affirms all the things that Jesus did. This is why Jesus so often when he would say something and they didn't get it, like Nicodemus, he's like, how do you not know this already? Yeah. You're the teacher of Israel and you don't know that you need to be born again? Maybe you've never heard that metaphor before. It's actually in the Old Testament if you go look it up, by mm -hmm. the way. Jesus just went farther with it. It's in Ezekiel, I believe. He, he's like, how do you not know this? Or they would ask him a question. He'd go, have you not read? Mm-hmm. He expected them to get this. So let's look at a few of these things that Jesus taught that seemed like innovations, but are actually not. And if you're actually Jewish and you're listening to this and you're like, these guys don't know what they're talking about. Well, let's, <laughs> let's look at this. Jesus taught that ritual is subordinate to righteousness. That rituals, symbols, and ceremonies are not as important as actual righteousness. We've already quoted a couple of these. Uh, Samuel, talking to Saul, said, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings than he does obedience and righteousness? Th that This is something that sounds shocking to someone's ears. If you think that salvation is through these, these sacrifices, when Samuel comes in and says, God would rather you not do any sacrifices and, and be obedient. Isaiah, he said, your new moons and your sacrifices are an abomination to me. I wish you would stop them. God never said that about righteousness. God mm -hmm. never said, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, your faithfulness mm -hmm. and your love and your justice are an abomination to me. Would you please stop it until you get the sacrifices right? He only said it the other way. Yeah. Uh, I, I desire obedience. Yes, I desire mercy yeah. and not sacrifice. D D David in Psalm 51, we already said it. Uh, you do not desire sacrifice or I would give it. And this is not that they shouldn't have been sacrificing. It's just that the rituals were not as important not even as important as humanitarian concerns. David was hungry, so he ate the showbread. You're not supposed to eat the showbread. It's like, yeah, but oh. this guy's he's about to die. Give him his give him I've the bread. I've heard so many sermons backflipping <laughs> over the point on that like basically like, well, really it's like, no, the the, the point of the, why do we have that in scripture? The point of that story is God is saying, the thing I I was giving you this to produce this heart and David had my heart, so since it wasn't a sin, I let him do it. Right? Yes. God never gave you an excuse if you did a sin because you had a good reason, yeah. but this wasn't a sin. So God was saying, no, okay, I'm, that's that's fine, right? And and again, that you know, all through, but then the uh, the opposite doesn't work. I, I did a sin, but I, I had a good reason. And, you know, like with Saul, right, where he's like, well, but I had a good reason to, to not, do, and, yeah. and Samuel wasn't was, happy was with Was Elijah that. in sin when he was at the Brook Cherith for years and then right. he was hiding in Sidon and didn't go to the temple? Of course not. Because yep. he was righteous. Right. That was the most important thing above the ritual. So Jesus coming in and, and saying these things and saying the temple is going to be torn down. And it's like, oh, how can you say that? Like, y'all, you, I can be worshipped without a temple. Mm. The ritual is subordinate to righteousness. How, here's this one. Jesus said that the center of the law is love for God and love for man. You know that the Pharisees, de Pharisees didn't even argue with Jesus on this one. They what knew. is the whole purpose of the law? Yeah. To love each other and to love God. And if you do those things, the New Testament even says, you don't need the law. If you love people, what do you need the law for? Because that's, that is the central and most important moral imperative. I mean, it's all over the Old Testament. And we're right? and to clarify, we're talking about truly loving people and loving God according to God's definitions of those things. We have to clarify because we live in a modern world. However, but, but it's important that we say that. That's what God was saying. Look, if I can, I will build in you a heart such that we can get rid of, we can fulfill this law and you can just continue walking with me doing exactly what I want you to do. That's what you're supposed to be as a Christian is somebody who does not need a law because you will do what's in God's heart. To who, somebody who would look at adultery and say, why would I do that? Well, well the, you know, we got to make laws against adultery. Well, if, if you were a Christian and filled with the Holy Spirit, you would look at that and say, I would never do that. That's not in God's heart. Yeah. Right. That's what God is is shooting for. And and so, again, that's why he says, I desire obedience, not sacrifice, is that you would you would look at the sacrifice and say, well, I don't even want to do what would need that. Yeah. What else did Jesus do? He opened up salvation to all the nations, not just to Israel. Uh -huh. And they hated him for that. Yes, they did. But is not that throughout the Old Testament? 
Rahab, Ruth. Um, I'm missing people, surely, but lots, lots yeah. of, you know, you know, like, but lots, lots, yeah. so many examples yes, of, of, course. of the stranger that came in and didn't just come in and get to be, sit there and be fed, but decided I'm going to follow your God. And God was, God, in fact, we've already been talking about this in, in uh, the law where God was many times making these little carve outs and saying, it, like incentivizing this, saying, yeah, I want this to happen. And that's what they were, they should have seen. Like this was God's point that he was trying to yeah. make this happen. And of course they started resisting it because they wanted to be. God's special and only people. And that's not what yeah, God well, was trying to do. Isaiah 49, 6, prophesying the coming of the Messiah. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you a light for the goyim, mm -hmm. the nations, the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. All the prophecies of the coming kingdom are about all the nations coming and worshiping the Lord. J the Lord told Abraham, in you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This was always the plan. Jesus was not innovating when he did that, nor was he even innovating when he said salvation is by grace through faith. When Paul said, by grace you are saved through faith, not of works lest any man should boast. That is exactly how they were saved in the Old Testament too. That's, what did, what did God way, say through Moses? That is super important because you people get people start teaching the Old Testament as if that was an innovation. And that's very important not to do. You... The, because when you teach the Old Testament as if that was an innovation, what secretly creeps in is we could just go back to the Old Testament way and get saved that way. I like the Old Testament way of, of keeping the law. Nobody was ever saved by keeping the law. Why? No. Because nobody kept the law, dude. N nobody ever kept the law, ever. David yeah. didn't keep the law. Look at look at David's life. David <laughs> no, David broke the law in creative ways, right? No nobody kept the law. What happened is you got to the end of the law as a schoolmaster and you said, I can't keep it. And yeah. you reached out to God in faith. That's always how we people were saved. Yeah. What did God say through Moses in Deuteronomy 7? It is not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. Mm -hmm. For you are the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. He says, I didn't choose you because you were good. In fact, you're not. <laughs> you're not very admirable. But I picked you. Because I love you, I've decided to love you. So even that in the Old Covenant, you guys, has, has been looking for the day. They're not To say nothing of all the prophecies looking forward, this would be a fun study for you. When Jesus teaches something, go back and find the place in the Old Testament that teaches the same thing. He was not mm. innovating. Right. He was completing the work by his death on the cross that made him the ultimate sacrifice that abolished all those things. But... Man, you need to know that his teachings and all of this was always the plan. It is always where things were going. A new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. For this reason, you could say that a Christian is both entirely free from the law and entirely bound to it. We are not under the law, but under grace, the Bible says. Paul said that in Romans chapter 6, verse 14 and verse 15. That we are not under the law, but we are under grace. That the law, it places as it's even been abolished. It's been abrogated because it's done. It's over. That, that dispensation has passed on to the new one. Even those that are covenant theologians agree with that. Mm -hmm. They only believe in a single dispensation change, but that's all right. We're with you on that piece, so we'll just, we'll just stand on it together. That... We're free from the law, and yet we are entirely bound to it because we have to use the sacrifice that the law provided. And if we don't, then we're going to be judged according to the law. Romans 2 says even either Moses' law or the law of our own conscience that God has placed upon our heart. Right. So, oh, Jeremiah 31, 33, I don't want to skip that, that the Spirit comes and writes the law of God on your heart so that you can walk fully in his righteousness because he's given you Christ's righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says that he who became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That you don't need to earn righteousness anymore. Jesus has given that to you. So, as a system of regulations, the law has no authority over the Christian. But as a revelation of God's heart and righteousness, it has an eternal authority that even goes deeper than the letters itself, you might say. Problems arise when people become infatuated with the regulations as a means of salvation. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. When they say, I, wa I want to try to keep these rules rather than saying, you know, this all was pointing to Jesus. It's, it's like coming to a story, you know, I, I didn't watch Lost. 
you know, but I <laughs> remember neither. when uh, it was on, man, everybody, what's going to happen the next week? Or, or 24 was my show at the time. I, I like to watch 24 with my family, and every commercial break, you know, there'd be the countdown, mm-hmm. Do-dum, do-dum, <laughs> and there'd be a commercial, and then it would come to a cliffhanger, and then go to the next week, and you're just like, oh, what's going to happen? I have found that if you go back and watch the season on DVD, or you stream it, it just does not have the same impact. Because it's kind of happened already, right? Right, right, right? And you can still see what happened at the end. It's kind of like that for us as Christians. Like, we're we're at the end of the story. The season is over. We're in a new season now. And there's something else that God is doing. But we can get infatuated with the, the system and the rules and the regulations. Paul said in Romans 10, verses 3 and 4, talking about the Jews, but these people are still around today, these kinds of people. Being ignorant of the righteousness of God... And seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law, Mm. the telos, the goal, the purpose, the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. I mean, again, Zach, I don't know how you wriggle out out from under that one. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And this is, if you hear us being so emphatic, it's because we really have concern over these things. And we've, we've worked them out through scripture to try and seek the Lord and ask him, how do we handle this? Right. And, you know, I don't remember. It just, it was a couple of years ago where I was, I was discussing this. Actually, I do remember I was in Israel talking with my dad about this very issue and we were coming to the conclusion. And and this is maybe speaking directly to those of you who might've come from a legalistic background or you still struggle with legalism. And lots of us are like that. We have a weak, the Bible says we have weaker consciences if we struggle with legalism. So that's important to know that that's a, that's a condition you can have spiritually. If you struggle with a weaker conscience, brother or sister, let me encourage you that legalism is not the safe option no right between between but that's how we can feel we can say well i i don't want to be a libertine right meaning i don't want to i don't want to fall into sin or or begin to displease the lord by the way i act so the safe thing to do is to be a legalist to put fences in front of the law brother (sighs) brother sister that's that's what the jews did yeah, is they put fences in, they put literal fences in front of the law. They made regulations and then regulations on the regulations. That is not the, it's, you're not protecting yourself because the sin of pride will creep in so far that you will make it harder for you to be saved. I've, I've heard it explained this way. It's like, don't throw, you know, don't throw a rock down the well. Okay. That's the rule. Yeah. Don't throw a rock down the well. So what do we do? We build a fence around the well. Mm-hmm. Now, sin is defined not as throwing a rock down the well, but crossing the fence. Right. Even though that's not what's mm-hmm. wrong. Yes. Kind of like when Eve was told, we're not even supposed to touch the fruit. And you, maybe that's pushing the passage, but it'll make the point. No, I think it's, yeah. You know, you say, don't she eat the fruit. Well, we're not even supposed to touch it. Okay, that might be a good rule, mm-hmm. but that's not, if she held it in her hand and then said no and then let it go, she hadn't sinned. Right. But what we can start to do is move the boundary back farther and farther and farther and farther, which might be helpful, but you need to realize that crossing the boundary you have drawn mm. is not the same thing as sinning. Yeah. I use this example often with with movies when people want to or media, video games, books, whatever. Yeah. Uh, watching a movie with murder in it is not the same thing as committing murder. Right. I mean, right? Obviously. Mm. Or or playing a video game where you're shooting somebody. You have not actually shot somebody. It's a computer game. Mm-hmm. Now there are people that want to say, "Oh, you shouldn't do that. That's wrong to do that because murder is wrong." This is not murder. Mm-hmm. This is a video game. This is a movie. It's like, well, you shouldn't commit adultery, and that movie had adultery in it. Okay, but they did not commit adultery. And well, if you lust, then you're then you're committing adultery. Okay, but if you don't lust, you haven't committed a sin. Now, you can be putting yourself in a stupid situation oh, where it's very sure. hard to avoid sin, but that's not the same thing as sinning, you guys. Right. You've got to get this mm. because you can really start to you, you can start to drive people away because they they say I haven't even done anything. And I'm already being condemned for the things I've done. You might have wise people come and say, "Please just watch out." I'll do this sometimes for our, our church sure. or our ministry teams or our friends. I'll say, guys, I'm just worried about this. Can we just please keep an eye on it? And sometimes people say, well, you tell us what to do. I'm like, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Mm. I'm just saying to be careful. It just seems like it's getting, it's just getting to be a little much. And I don't, I don't want to see us cross the line. So it's, it's not good. It's not. That's why I said it was a pain. It's a pain for yourself. Yes. Well, you're, you're bringing all this extra the Extra Bible calls stuff, it binding man. up heavy burdens and laying it on people's shoulders. That's what you're doing is you're, you're creating this burden that God didn't want you to carry. And you're laying it on someone's shoulder and saying, here, not only must you not sin, but now you have to keep my special rules to keep you from sinning. And, yep. and if you don't, then that is a sin. And the struggle with those is that they have, and this is the sad tragedy of legalism. They have no power against the flesh. Mm-hmm. You will end up breaking all of the rules you set and then also all of God's rules. 
and know it and feeling guilty and terrible about it. And so the, the, that's why we encourage people with things like the law is, is like, look, the, the correct thing to do is to run to Jesus. Yes. Ask for the Holy Spirit to fill you, because then when the Holy Spirit fills you, even when you transgress the actual sins, you, you will know that you did it. You'll immediately have godly sorrow, not condemnation, and they're different. And you'll run back to him and ask for forgiveness. It's a totally different thing than, well, I, I accidentally, you know, I accidentally saw a movie that depicted something bad. And now I think I might have done something bad. That feeling in your heart, that's not from the Holy Spirit. That condemnation, that, that like, I might have accidentally worshipped a pagan god through Christmas. Yeah. That's not that heart of the Lord, you know? Yeah, people have a, this is why we get upset, man, because yeah. people have a hard enough time accepting the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. When you start drawing the it's boundaries true. out wider and wider, and some people will do this in order to have authority over people. You know, there was a guy, yes, yes they will. Uh, he did not attend our church, but a lot of people at our church really, in, in back home, not, not in Alabama, but they really liked this guy's stuff. And he had a lot of things to say about the law. And he was sort of like this internet edgelord kind of guy, like just really aggressive and angry. And if you're not keeping the feast and you're, you're not really saved and... You know, it. We we come to find out this guy was involved in all kinds of sick sexual sin, mm. and they when he was confronted on it, he said, "Well, look, I'm not married, so these these laws don't apply to me because I'm not committing adultery against my wife." And then like that, there it is, right there. That's not everybody that does this, but this guy is like, yes, there it is. You you have managed to find a way of obedience that is. Uh, that that is external to your soul, mm. like you know, don't don't <laughs> eat pork. Oh, that'll oh, wow! But because you Preach. can't control the one that is actually in your soul, and yes. then in order to convince yourself of it, if I may make the comparison, like the gay pride movement, you've got to be angry and loud and convince everybody else that what I'm doing is okay and what you're doing is wrong. Mm-hmm. You've got to be shouting, shouting, shouting all the time because if you were to be quiet for five seconds, the conviction would fall upon you so heavy you wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning. Mm-hmm. And this is so common and all these legalistic preachers that like oh it turned out this guy was doing this stuff all along and to the, those to the point then, that i begin to suspect usually when, when deep legalism mm-hmm. is in someone's life yeah, i start to ask true. and i'll even ask them i'll say what is it that's going on really if i'm st- talking to somebody and they'll be like well we need to do this we need to do that and they're angry i'll say what is going on in your heart because so many times that like you said that's external trappings that they're putting on to convince themselves that really this thing they can't fix is okay i have found Many, many, many times. I've dealt with this quite a bit, actually, this this whole thing. Mm. Uh, there's a whole thing online called the Hebrew Roots Movement. And, uh, you know, you talk about people that, you know how they say, like, in politics, like, when somebody says, well, nobody wants to do that, like, that's the next thing they're going to do. <laughs> yeah. That is the Hebrew Roots Movement. Mm. I preached against it one time, and somebody took me out to lunch and was all upset. And he was like, well, you're saying that we believe you have to keep the law to be saved. We don't believe that. Nobody's saying that. And I told him, well, there are people in your movement that believe that we shouldn't, that Paul shouldn't even be part of the New Testament. Yes. I said, well, I'm not that. And that, that's a very rare case. And nobody wants to do it. Well, guess what? A few years later, that's exactly what had happened. Mm-hmm. He also left his family because he believed, well, if they're not going to keep this right doctrine, then I need to be holy and separate myself from them. And But very often, guys, what I was going to say, people have trouble in their marriages and they get into this stuff. I, I, they're unhappy in their personal lives. A lot of times it is huh. men who, yeah. I, it, just my experience yes, now, no, I, I verify men that. who are, are, have weak personalities, who feel like they don't have a lot of control over their life, who feel like their marriages have kind of slipped away from them, and they get into these weird doctrinal things, especially this legalism thing. I think there's an attraction to the pride, kind of like real hyper-Calvinism can be. Like, mm-hmm. I can accept this, and none of the rest of you plebeians can. <laughs> yeah. And... and it's not good, guys. If you are finding yourself drawn to these things because you think that, oh, I'm just, well, I, I don't think there's enough power, enough strength in just the simple gospel, then you haven't understood the simple gospel, guys. Yeah. Yeah. If if what, you, if what you're calling people to cannot be described by Jesus saying, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, then, oh, you, then you are not calling you people to the gospel. Right now, now, and I listen, I guys, I've, I've been you, I've struggled with this. I hear what you're saying, but what about, right? But how will we call people away from sin? What about this? Doesn't it make sense to you that if I go over here and, and I do this, then I, then I will fall into sin. Yes, it does make sense. Legalism always makes sense, but the Holy Spirit is not a formula. He's a person and he wants to come and fill you with such power against sin that it won't make sense. A person truly filled with the Holy Spirit should be able to walk through. I mean, we, we're being called to walk into dark places, guys, not to just hide away from sin, 
right? So we should be able to walk through the darkest of places and not be stained. That's what the Bible says. That's what that's why Peter says, look, you're you've already been washed. You're clean. I'm just yep. going to clean off your feet, right? So yeah, they, this should be an encouraging, this doctrine should be so encouraging to us to know that this is not the way we are pleased or what, how we please the Lord is by our keeping of rules and regulations. It I, didn't I, work I, for the Jews. It's not going to work for us. I got to ask people sometimes like, well, what did, what did Jesus die for then? Yeah. What oh, was the that's, purpose yes. of the death of Jesus. So important. And you guys, th this slide, this Hebrew root slide that people get on, it starts with, hey, maybe we ought to, it starts with an interest in the Old Testament. And then it gets to, hey, we ought to do more of these things. Hey, I think I'm actually going to start worshiping on Saturday. Is that okay? Of course. I think I want to abstain from the foods. Is that okay? And then now it becomes, well, now I'm more spiritual than you. Mm. Now you can't be saved unless you do this. Now none of my relationships are worthwhile because I've got this thing going on. And then the next step is Paul was wrong. We should never have gotten to Paul. Yes. And the next step after that, you guys, is Jesus was wrong. This is where this stuff leads that Jesus yes. yeah. was a mistake, that we didn't need this sacrifice. And, and this is, I mean, even this, these things that seem so silly, like people want to insist that you call Jesus Yeshua rather than Jesus. That's one of those telltale markers for me, actually, that I'm dealing with somebody who's into legalism. Because is that really what we're going to be concerned about is how we've transliterated his name? You're not even pronouncing it right if you want to get into that. Yeah. It's, you know, it's it, that... This leads you to saying, well, Jesus, it, we didn't need that sacrifice. We just need to keep the law. But you're forgetting what we've just said, that you can't keep the law. You're back to the same place. Mm. And this is why Paul says, if you go back to that stuff, Christ will be of no use to you. No. It's like you're crucifying him again. You know, the strongest, the, I, I, it was your, your dad actually taught a sermon on Hebrews that really blew my mind because he said all those strong passages in the Bible about apostasy that, that people who struggle with legalism really deal, we, like, they can like bind us up. We're like, well, what if I accidentally, what if I, what if I did the wrong thing? And now I've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. He says, these are about legalism. <laughs> these strong statements of if you go back here, you are trampling on Jesus. It's about legalism, guys. Yep. That's why we're, you know, if you can hear us pleading with you, like, please let this go. It's because you're grabbing on to the very thing that you're afraid of. You're grabbing onto the thing that could, if you're not careful, I'm not trying to put a trip on anybody, but that legalism leads down a road of forsaking the grace of Jesus. And that's why it's so important to let go of it. It would be better. Let me say this carefully. It would be better for us to, to struggle with sin and be forgiven than to be bound up in legalism and lose the grace of Jesus. Yeah. Is that fair? You're my let's, pastor, let's, so you can yes, check me on that. That seems mean, right. Let's just spend some time talking about what it means to be under grace. Mm. You know, and this is why it's so hard is because we want to have something external we can cling to. But guys, yes. you're not given that. Yeah. You're not given that. You're given faith that Jesus' death was enough for you. That you crying out to Jesus and saying, Lord, save me. Mm -hmm. That that is enough. The Holy Spirit comes and fills you. He begins to transform your heart from the inside. More that, than enough. It's, yeah. It's exactly what you, you need. When you sin, yeah. Paul says, ah, it's no longer I who sin. I'm not really the sinner here anymore. It's like, how can you say that, Paul? <laughs> he says, well, it's because uh, I'm in this body. My body is still corrupted by sin until I die and get resurrected. So I'm always going to have the temptation, but that's not mine. So, yeah, that, that sounds like antinomian, doesn't it? That sounds like there is no such thing as sin. But what Paul says is, well, I'm under grace, man. His, his grace is sufficient for me. It's mm -hmm. enough to forgive me. You can walk in that freedom. And, and so much of my ministry as a pastor, not just mine, but anybody's, is getting people to realize that Jesus' death was enough. That the death and resurrection of Jesus yep. is enough. You're forgiven. You're already forgiven. You don't have to do something else. You don't have to earn it. It's Jesus and only Jesus. And you know what's the marker of that? Because again, I can hear the voices in, in my head because I know they're coming from other people too. That doesn't make people want to sin more. No. It makes people want to sin less, right? Why? Because the, the, just as it's the opposite, just as legalism can't produce in you godliness, it does it have no effectiveness against the flesh. The Holy Spirit and grace has ultimate effectiveness against the flesh. Once you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, you don't want to play around with sin, which is why when Jesus was so strong about things, he he was reminding them of what the law was really for. He's like, this was just to wake you up to the fact that I can't stop lusting after other people. That's all the law was for. It was just to wake you up to the fact that I, I'm angry with my brother all the time. I want to kill my brother, even if I haven't. And, and Jesus is waking up to, the problem is in you, dude. And you need to go to Jesus. And if you can accept by faith that Jesus has taken care of that problem for you, you immediately love him so much that it changes the way you look at your brother. 
You say, well, if Jesus could die for me, even though I absolutely don't deserve that, am I really going to get so angry at this guy and want to kill him over what? Like, look at what Jesus has done for me. It, it yeah. changes. That's the only thing that can change your heart and, and make you want to stop sinning. Yeah, and, and here's what else it does is it forces you, and this might have been part of what God was up to, is it <laughs> forces you to run to Jesus personally every single day. Yes. Yeah. I've uh-huh. got to yeah, be close right. to Jesus, yeah. to a closer walk with thee, right? That's the old song. Is that day or the, another one, day by day, right? Mm-hmm. This is my, I need you day by day. Oh, Lord, I need thee every hour. I need thee because. Because you don't have rules we, anymore. Yes, because there's no yep. there's no external standard to follow. The standard is Jesus. And so we need, oh, Lord, I'm going to need you today. It's like, yep, yeah, you're going to. So you got you to gotta stick close to me. But now you're the love that between, begins to grow between the two. The same love that David had. Mm-hmm. That even David, when he had sinned, he goes, I know that I'll, been, I'll be forgiven. Even Job, when he was afflicted, as terribly as he was, said, I know that my Redeemer lives. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, man, blessed be the name of the Lord. That, and this is for people that have a hard time relating to God as a person. You've got to look for a system. You've got to look for rules. Uh, and, yes. And... That's what uh, our religion should not be defined by rule. Our religion is defined by liberty, by freedom. And, and when we see sin on the rise, the temptation is to say, well, we've got to tighten the bands. Yes. No, no, no. The opposite of that is true. We never loosen up on sin, but we offer forgiveness to people. How many people, y'all, do you know how many people are running around today that w- are, are, that despise their life but feel like there's no way out for them. There's mm-hmm. no forgiveness for them, so I might as well just continue this way. And you come and tell them that Jesus loves them, and they just break in an instant. Yep. I've seen hardened criminals burst into tears. At what lesson? The lesson that you, know, the, you, you can keep these 10 rules and it'll be okay. You just follow this system. No, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's it. That's what breaks the heart of a man. 100%. Wouldn't you rather have that, you guys? Yeah. If it's you can, if you've ever you ever done children's ministry before, <laughs> I have. <laughs> yeah. Well, have you ever had one of those kids that's just a real problem? Yes. Like I was just one and of you can they, <laughs> and you can see them walking in. And you're like, uh oh, we're gonna have a real problem, right? Batten down the hatches. Do you know how you handle those kids though? Because there's two different ways. The one way. Is get that, a male teacher for the classroom. Well, first of all, yes. But what does that male teacher do? There's two different ways. The one way, the, the temptation is, well, okay, this kid needs 17 rules about how they need to, right? Or the other way is, if you if you make that kid the special object of your, like, love and attention. I've done this. These kids, like, come to me. I don't know why. They just always, I always end up with them. And you, you're going to treat this kid like he's the, your favorite, right? Instead of he's the problem. What happens is you will... You will break that kid's heart immediately and they will follow you around like a puppy dog. They might they might act the same way with everybody else, but you, they want to be around. And yeah. then it's really easy to say, hey, could you not do that one thing that we need you not to do, right? That's what the Lord does with us. He, instead of loading us up with a system that we can't keep, even in guys, that's even what the law was. It was, he wanted to, he was, you know, sometimes I think that's why the Lord was being so harsh in a sense with us is he wanted to get us as fast as possible to the stage of, well, I can't keep that. Yep. So that he could have a real relationship with us. It was like he, he, it would have been better to be quick through that stage than slow. So he ma- made sure the law was just an iron thing that you would be like, well, what are we even supposed to do with that? Yeah. So even under the law, the, the intention was always to get us to grace. And I will tell you this too. We should not overlook this, this fact that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells your heart. It's called regeneration. When your heart is defibrillated, and begins to beat again. Mm-hmm. And now yes, yes, yes. your desires begin to change. And now your conscience begins to be reawakened. And now you don't have desires for those old things anymore. And in fact, you despise the thought that you ever did them. And you start to, to feel your conscience tugged in this one direction. And your love for Jesus begins to grow. And you, the word of God all of a sudden becomes alive to you. We cannot neglect this supernatural transformation that takes place. I know folks that have had the most sorry born again story you've ever heard. Yeah, I I guess I'll be a Christian, but the Holy Spirit takes them seriously Mm -hmm. and everything starts to change from the inside out. So if you say, I don't know if I can do this, then you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need the baptism with the Holy Spirit that changed Peter from a coward into a lion. 
that, that changed Paul from a legalist and a terrorist to an apostle and an evangelist. That's, exactly That's right. what you need is the touch of Almighty God. We cannot keep treating Christianity like this is merely a human activity. If work. we're going to do that, it's going to fail every single time. Where does God fit into this? If God only appears as a judge in your system, you missed it. Mm. Because Jesus said, I'm going to depart from you because it'll be better for the Holy Spirit will come and dwell within you. Uh, so many Christians, even who agree with us on all these issues, miss that. Mm -hmm. That there's an active, ongoing, personal presence of the Holy Spirit in your life at all times. And that is something that was prophesied by Ezekiel and Jeremiah that would take place only under the new covenant. So why are you messing around with the old covenant, guys? Yeah. Jesus has already done it. He's the sacrifice. He's the temple. He's the blood. He's the covering. He's the Sabbath. He's all of the things that you're trying to be, but he offers it to you freely because you couldn't earn it. A new and better, right? That's the refrain all the way through Hebrews. Yep. Now we have a new and better one, right? And it's that is a joyful thing, man. That's, Whatever that's thing you get obsessed with man it's jesus is better yeah so what do we learn from all this well first of all that salvation is not restricted to the jews because it's for everybody jesus died once for all that salvation is not found in the law although the law as paul said testifies of it but it's christ and it's christ alone mm. so when you open up the old testament law we read it as New Testament believers. We are eager to obey God's righteousness as it is revealed, yet as a system of regulations, it has no binding and no bearing upon you any longer. Mm -hmm. And for those that want to come and say, you know, I once heard uh, there's this online atheist who gave an explanation of why he was an atheist. And he said, well, I tried being a Christian. I was going to be the most, I was going to take it seriously and do exactly what we're supposed to. And he described how he got involved in this Hebrew roots cult. Mm hmm and I was like, you weren't, you, oh, you, you have been deceived into you thinking it, you yeah. found the gospel and you didn't because somebody who probably did know the Lord, but was messing around with all this weird stuff, got you hooked into all of this. Mm -hmm. And now your soul has been shipwrecked. God help that man yeah. that put you in this position. Yeah, absolutely. Th this is what Paul says when he's writing to Timothy. He says, charge certain persons. <laughs> Don't you love that? Don't you love that? <laughs> can you imagine being there subtweeted by yeah. people? Can you imagine being subtweeted by Paul? You're reading, you're like, oh no, I'm certain persons. <laughs> certain persons not to teach any different doctrine yeah. than what he had just said that the grace and the mercy and peace from God in Christ. Nor, so don't teach anything else, devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. <laughs> there are still these people to this day yeah. that have these endless mystical, strange interpretations of the Old Testament, which Paul says we ought not to do because they promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith, meaning the, the order of God that is by faith, the taking good care of your life, that you wasting all your time chasing down which pieces of the Old Testament law do I have to keep and what is the deep, deeper significance of this genealogy and the Kabbalistic literature and Gnostic mm -hmm. stuff. He's like, that is not going to make you a better Christian. It's not going to produce more faith. He says, the aim of our charge is love, issues from a pure heart with a good conscience and sincere faith. Real basic, right? Yep. Just just do it, man. Just obey God. Don't try to get weird with it. Certain persons, verse 6, by swerving from these, by swerving from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith, have wandered away into vain discussion. And boy, is there an awful lot of <laughs> vain discussion about the gospel and the Bible on the internet, man. Desiring, verse 7, to be teachers of the law. So these people that are endless speculation mm -hmm. and moving away from sincere, simple faith and empty, pointless discussion are those that want to be teachers of the law, he says, without understanding either what they're saying. It's like you don't, Paul's like, I am a rabbi, all right? <laughs> you have no idea what you're talking nope. about or the things about which they make confident assertions. And, and a lot of this Hebrew roots and legalistic and Adventist stuff, guys, it's a, it's a confidence scam. Yeah. It's like, what's that movie? Catch me if you can. Mm -hmm. He walks yep. into the room, pretends to be the teacher, Walk even though fast, he's a student. Talk fast, yeah. Right? It's like, that. they say, well, I know what I'm talking about. But when you look at it, I read one guy who said, we should never have trusted Paul because his Hebrew name is Saul. And the consonants of the name Saul are the same as the consonants for the word Sheol in the Old Testament. So he <laughs> was the, the death no. and the grave and to believe in him. And that's why he had to change his name. Very convincing. You, you sound so confident, but you don't know what you're talking about. Mm. 
And I don't even think he's right in that, that the consonants are the same, by the way. <laughs> and But it's, yeah. it's, it's so, or people, like people say, well, you know, the Bible was originally written in Aramaic. So we have to read it in Aramaic. To which I, I say, why? You say that so confidently. You don't even know that that's true, by the way. So there are people that will translate the Greek into Aramaic and then translate the Aramaic into English. That sounds good. And then study that because that's the real. You, you're saying that so con- You don't know what you're talking about. Mm. So Paul says now in verse 8, now we know that the law is good if you use it lawfully. Oh, what do you mean? How do we use it lawfully? That the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. So, if you're the kind of person that feels like you need the law in your life, according to the Apostle Paul, you're unholy and profane. And I have found in my experience, people that get into this stuff are very profane in that they speak about righteousness. They speak about God. They speak about Christ with disdain and arrogance in their mouth. Instead of verse 11, being in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I've been entrusted. Mm-hmm. It, can you honestly say that your salvation is good news, guys? If hmm. you can't, then, then just leave it alone, man. Mm. Zach, can I just ask you one more time just to speak to that infatuation that I know you've come across so much that modern Christians have with, with Judaism, and they feel like they're somehow being more spiritual and getting closer to the foundation when they sure. they do that? Because that's such a temptation, and it's such a deception. Look, there's I'm all for understanding biblical history, all that. That's great. What I would encourage you is, if you begin asking questions of people who do not believe that Jesus is their Messiah, then you've made a mistake. Yes. And there are many, many people that want to take you to that place of, well, what what do the Jews think about it? What do the Jews think about it? Well, look, what, Jesus had some hard words to say about the Pharisees and the people that you're going to in, in the Middle Ages and everything, they are the children of the Pharisees. And, and, and so I, I don't say that. Like the to, Pharisees so much, read Paul. Yeah, <laughs> right. And I, I'm not saying that, you know, to, I'm not saying that to, to hate on them. I'm just saying what the Bible says that for, they are your, your beloved, you know, from the standpoint of God's choice, but from the standpoint of the gospel, you're enemies. And so I'm just saying what Paul says, right? Now, now, what, 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 but, but in, in studying the, 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 in studying the feasts, I've been so built up in my faith. Okay, p- possibly, but, but the, it seems to me as I have, and look, I have studied these things. I have sat under the teaching of people who've studied these things. I have spent a lot of time in Israel, the center of where these things are studied. <laughs> and I, I'm just humbly advancing to you that all of the New Testament is talking about holding on to the head, which is Christ. Yes. That's the obsession of the New Testament. I want to be obsessed about what the New Testament is obsessed about. I want to be obsessed about the completion, not the shadow. I want to be obsessed about what is now, not what was then, right? So if you are if you're going back to that stuff because well I'm trying to study this to understand so I can teach in the Old Testament, that's fine, but I would just encourage you to be there are some doors which lead to bad places. This in my experience is one of them. So if yep. you open the door to do some study, good. Now shut the door. And let us let let's pay attention to what it is that we're supposed to. Paul says to cling on to the head, right? That's yeah. what we're supposed to do. So not I like would just Star Trek, huh? Not like Star Trek. Not like though, that. To no. cling on to. Sorry, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, and yeah, I, w- I would just encourage that. Look, like it, the, whatever you are studying in Scripture, it should lead you to be more obsessed with Jesus. Yeah, and it, even if you don't know how to answer somebody, guys, if the if the final it's destination right. is anything other than faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, walk away. Yeah. Don't let them, they, a lot of these guys, they have like the personality of an internet troll and, and they come at you and they're so angry. They are, so aggre- they are a lot of yeah. them and they're so aggressive and they're so insistent and they come into the church every now and then. they blow through churches, they blow through home fellowships and well, don't you think we ought to do this and that? If the sun has set you free, you are free indeed. Amen. Uh, don't, don't not, sub- <laughs> don't not, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Mm-hmm. Be free. Just be free and, and throw everything upon Jesus. The Lord does not deny, desire sacrifice. He only desires one sacrifice and he gave it. Mm-hmm. And that was his son, Jesus. And if you have not received him, then now is the day you've got to do that. Guys, I've taught through, uh, maybe by the time you hear this, the entirety of the Pentateuch mm-hmm. of the first five books of the Bible. Go listen to it. Hear it taught. I love studying the feasts and the festivals and the new moons and the Sabbaths. I love all of those things because I love the Bible, but I despise how some people have made them a 
a club with which to beat over the children of God who have been set free mm. forever in Jesus Christ. It was The goal was always to get to Jesus. That's the continuity. But the discontinuity is now the shadow has passed away. The regulations are no longer binding. And now we obey God. We do not sin. We walk in righteousness because of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. All right? Amen. All right, guys. Well, before we go, there's only one more thing I want to let you know. Uh, Ironworks has put out a another book. Uh, we have a couple. We haven't talked about these before, I don't think. But uh, I just finished writing. We published now a, a book called Difference Makers, uh, which is a 21-day devotional that I've written. And um, Zach, talk for a minute about we we the plan for Ironworks is not just to be a podcast, but to be uh, a resource center. We we can produce things like this, right? Yeah. We basically we want to we want to encourage and especially if you're listening to us and you're a, a pastor of a of a Calvary Chapel and you're you're one of those guys I and mean, there's lots of us out there where it's we've got a book and we're working on it and we want to make that available to people and you should if the Lord's filled you with a, a vision and an encouragement for the church we're hoping our vision our hope is to be able to help people make that happen so we're working on that right now it's starting with us putting out Tyler's books and and making those available and we want to start bringing more things to that and we're we've got ideas in the works for things like we you know blogs and and you know but good <laughs> and uh you know books but Videos, but really but really good and yeah we've been doing putting right. the conferences together as a as a just an evergreen resource for people to go get and guys the goal here is not to you know i don't know make a lot of money or anything the goal is to bless the church and we, we want to make as many resources as widely available as possible um and i guys i've, I've read tyler's books he here tyler can just tune out for a minute he, he's Done. my pastor and my friend <laughs> but these books are excellent they're encouraging they've been a blessing to my walk um we've got struggle and surrender which is a book kind of walking through the journey of uh of jacob and kind of his you know how that can be applied to us which i really really encourage you to go get a hold of um we've also got a book called his final days which is more of like a devotional um with chapters on the uh, leading up to jesus crucifixion which is excellent and then this one is a devotional version of kind of looking through different people in scripture who have, have made a huge difference for the kingdom. Tyler, talk about, because I've, I've read it's, this again. It's it was Elijah. Good. It's, it's Elijah's yeah, yeah. life. And this came out of uh, our prayer meetings. Or we, we usually yes. do some time to study uh, the Bible some during our prayer meetings. Fancy that. Uh, we talked about Elijah for a lot. And I thought, you know what? I would love to compile these. And I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is a devotional book. It's shorter than the other ones, about a thousand word chapters per day so enough to kind of it's not like my utmost for his highest which you can read like you know walking to your car um <laughs> very good but you yeah know, it's very short but it's not also not a long long one either um but it's talked about the life of elijah and the perspective is of somebody who wants to be a difference maker in their life if you want to be the person that comes in and by the power of god changes things and we follow through the life of elijah i think the lord gave me some really great insights i try to write at least with this kind of book i try to write with a lot of a uh, kind of a casual tone mm. to give a lot of uh even things like pop cultural references and, and give some very practical examples. So I think that you guys would enjoy it's it. It's quite readable. Um, and uh, it's available on uh, Calvary Chapel Trustville's website. If you go there, mm -hmm. uh, click on resources. It's on the Ironworks Media uh, website as well. You can go to Amazon to search for Tyler Warner. Um, it's not very well known, so you got to scroll through a little bit on Amazon. <laughs> but the book is called Difference Makers, a 21-day devotional. And I hope you guys will come and pick it up. It'll really help us out. And uh, this is what we want to do into the future, so we don't mind telling you about it. And you can probably be checking the YouTube channel coming up pretty soon here, too. Uh, we're probably going to do some videos related to uh, the book that's just coming out to help awesome. us promote it. Tell your friends. And thank you all so much for listening. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time with us, talking about the Old Covenant, the New Covenant. And uh, we're going to do, I believe, one more in this series. So we will see you then. God bless you guys. See you guys. Thanks. Thanks.